everyone, and welcome to the London, Ontario Comic Con. London, Ontario, not London, 2017. Uh, we have a division of uh, the London Comic Con which uh, focuses on horror and uh, the crazy movies from around the world, and that is in the Shock Stock area of the London Comic Con. Myself, my name is James Balkowski. I helped uh, organize Shock Stock in London about seven years ago. I am blessed to have had the people to my left at our event as well uh, over the years and they're gonna, we're going to talk about uh, the wild insane Italian horror genre and I'm going to introduce the credentials. So at first I have the lovely Doretta Doretta from Lamberto Baba's Demons, direct, uh, produced by Dario Argento, uh, also from uh, Rats, that's what I told Customs. She's <laughs> <laughs> <Case of> Rats! <laughs> Shock and Dark, Bruno Matai, and many, many other credits including some from the Lucio Fulci. And then, uh, to beside Doretta, we have the amazing, talented, keyboardist, extraordinaire, progressive rocks legend, Gentle Giant Who, they don't exist, we have Maurizio Grigliani from Goblin, alright! Soundtrack composer. Alright, so, uh, not to try to hijack the show, but uh, my, uh, what got me into this primarily was a young age, like every horror fan will say, and you know, the American films were, entertaining to an extent, but when I started reading about the Italian films, I was just amazed once I finally started getting hold of them. And in those days you had to like, uh, especially in Canada where a lot of these movies were prohibited, you had to like mail 25 US to some guy in a P.O. box in <laughs> South Jersey and you'd get a manila envelope in the mail like, you know, two months later and there would be this like, you know, masking tape and it would say opera on it or something, and you, wow. you know, and then if it had Japanese subtitles it would be a 50 generation copy, but that's how I was exposed to a lot of these films. And the soundtrack and the visuals of the Italian films always like struck a chord with me in terms of uh, how impressive they were. And so uh, I always put those films in the highest regard to me, more so than the American films, because they stand out. Like, for example, last night we played Suspiria to a practically sold out audience. And, you know, it was amazing to see it uh, be captivated to a new generation of fans. And, and it, you know, it's even my own children are, are still interested in it, you know, by its beautiful imagery and, and use of sound. So, um, I think maybe we can just maybe start with the traditional thing. Like, how did you get in with the, as a young woman? How did you get thrown into this? Because you are not of Italian born in Italy, am I right on that? No, no, I'm North yeah. American, but I lived in Italy so long that I felt like I'm Italian, and Maurizio says to me all the time, uh, you, you, you think like an Italian, so yeah, we're 50 50 at this point. Right, and then you just for how you discovered and got the roles? Or? Well, I, um, so I'm originally from Pacific Northwest, and I was uh, going to school, and I was, I think it was probably my freshman year of college, and I decided to transfer to New York, and I was going to FIT, to go to the Fashion Institute of Technology, as you do, and uh, I saw a long line outside, and all these people waiting, and I thought, what's going on? They said, this is an audition, and we're trying to uh, get into a Broadway play. Well, I neither sing nor dance, but that didn't tell me not to get the line. So I waited in the line about five hours, got my shot, wasn't very good, and somebody said, honey, you need to, you need to get patient. <laughs> you obviously don't know what you're doing. And then one thing led to another, and I went to HB Studios, and I started doing off on Broadway, and I did a, a lot of stand-up, uh, not stand-up comedy, we were in um, improv groups, and I was at a party um, that the Italian Inst uh, Arts Council was giving, and it had something to do with John Lennon and his then, uh, a, not then, because I'm not that old, a wife he had, <laughs> um, May Pang, and uh, she was publishing a book. And I got invited to the party, and someone saw me there, and I got hired as a model to do uh, some commercials for a very well known company that still exists in Italy. And my first uh, experience to Italy was Venice for 15 days in the San Marco Hotel in Daniele. And if you've ever been to Italy, you know, oh my God, I mean, that's people win that as a game show prize. I mean, that, it's, a, it's an incredible place to go. And I went, oh, I think I like this. And I went back home and I started studying in Italian and I wanted to figure out a way to go there and be able to stay because I only had a tourist visa the first time. So I applied to Centro Sperimentale in the directing program and I was invited to come over. And what was the first Italian like film that you were casting? Well, when I got there, I I did the first two parts of my college exam uh, written, 
and then the third part was to speak Italian to the professors and tell them my ideas. What they did is they gave you a series of photographs, and then you were supposed to tell them what kind of movie you would do, and what would the genre be, and I mean, what a mix, what a mix of high school Spanish and made up Italian. Like, I knew a few things, but not that much. So they said to me, um, tell you what, why don't you work on your Italian and come back in September, come back in a few months. But between the time, that's probably June, and September, I worked on uh, Texas Gladiators the year 2020, oh, which is Texas Gladiatori. <laughs> and I never made it back, unfortunately, but I never made it back to the film school in Italy. I went later in the United States, but that was the first one I did. Wow, and now uh, a lot of these Italian films, were they uh, speaking, because like, the cast would be like yourself international, so everyone's speaking in different languages in the, in the That's a rule. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think the first movie I worked on, that was it's called Presa Directa, when you have actual sound on the set, because usually the films are shot without sound. And then there's 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 several layers of, um, of talent in Italy, so there'll be actors, and then there are people who just do the voices. And it's the same, the guy that does uh, De Niro, does De Niro. The guy that does Al Pacino, does Al Pacino. They don't switch it up and it's a different voice. And it's the same thing even for our level of movies. I mean, there's a group of people that would do the dubbing. So I, I speak English, and because of how I look, I always play some form of a, of a North American, whether it's in the future or present tense or whatever. So usually, I, if it is in direct sound, I, I act in English and then the other person will act in their mother language. And most of the films I, were, I was in, because they are lower budgets, they are big uh, co-productions. So I've been in movies where there's been one actor speaking to me in French, one actor speaking to me in German, rarely other actors speaking to me in English, and the other people speaking to me in Italian. And I have to act and respond on cue, on time, to what they're saying. And you learn how to get it, you get it from tone, because upset or worried or whatever, it's still the same tone, even if you don't know what the, because you know what the script is, and you kind of, you you listen for those moments and you respond. It's almost like working in blue screen, but with audio, like you're yeah. in another language yeah, where yeah. you have to like, yeah. re, you know, I couldn't even imagine. That's a good, yeah, that's a good but, description. Yeah. But yeah, so in, in rats where we're a ragtag, you know, that was always a thing, ragtag team in the yeah. future, yeah. you know, so then we were French, there was a Russian, there was a Czech girl, two Italians, I'm American, Sydney's American, and so there was some other bizarre language. And I mean, everyone's all, because rats are attacking us, so everyone's yelling at you in different, in different languages. And on that shoot, no one in the production spoke English. Not one person. And I was not fluent in Italian by the time I did rats at all. So that's, that's interesting and tough to do. Wow. And now these movies, were they like, they're shot like fast and dirty, like they got it done. They wasn't be where these weren't like, you know, eight week shoots were they quicker than that? No, no. Um, uh, when I worked with Bruno, they were three week shoots, which wow. isn't that short. I mean, people in America do shoots over the weekends right. for a long time. No, they were like three weeks or four weeks. I think Demons was Demons might have been six weeks altogether, but that the first two were for the exteriors in Berlin. But by the time I was on it, it was maybe four weeks, and even then, I was only on it ten days. I probably only have. Uh, 12 minutes of screen time, but I eat it up. <laughs> sure do. Sure do. You own that film. Yeah. But yeah, so, so no, and so in the sense of what they're shot like, no, at that time, it was still, I say that time, it was the 1930s, it's not, it's just the 80s, which I know seems like a long time ago. But, uh, and it is, but it's not that long ago. But um, there, it was still sort of the studio system in a sense. So, no, nothing felt, first of all, Italians don't go, don't do this thing, oh, it's my vision, I gotta get my shit. No, it's a job, you have a wife, you have kids, you wanna go home. So you shoot to seven, eight, there's not this, let's shoot till midnight, let's shoot all night, let's get golden time. It doesn't exist, you come to work, you do your thing, you do your wine, it's about seven. Now I'm all ragazzi, watching Let's go kids, I wanna eat, yeah. and it's over. Yeah, and you get, um, we, in the scale that I was in, because I wasn't a lead, I wasn't above the line with my name on the top, we got a flat fee, right. and it was paid to you by the week, and the uh, engineer, not engineer, another name, but the accountant comes on uh, Friday, and everybody gets their money, which is a very sane, come on in, which is a very sane way to do it. Movies don't really go over budget, because they bring the money every week, if you're the director and you haven't shot the stuff, people aren't getting paid. The actors are not getting paid, guess it's not going to finish the movie. So you get your money on Friday, and the meals are there. 
the, you, and every, it's, a, it's a, like a cafeteria. And you go in and you have lunch, and if you're on location, the lunches uh, come, which you'll remember. The lunches come and they say to you, red or white. I'm like, what? Hey? <laughs> Bianca Rosso. Huh? And it's, do you want red or white? And it will come with white wine or red wine. Yeah. And I don't like red, and what it is, it's the sauce. Yeah. And I don't like tomato red sauce, so I was always Bianco, Bianco. Yeah. So you get a white sauce, so you get a pasta with a white sauce, a piece of meat, and a piece of salad, a little bottle of wine. It could never happen in North America. People would be like, selling the wine, doing all kinds of stuff. And it just doesn't exist there. You have a couple of soups, you go, know, you have a coffee, you go to work. There's no abuse of any sort. Now, Marisa, you're obviously best known from for Gallo, but you've also worked on other films as session players that did the Italian uh, horrors. Um, did you? Uh, oh, yeah, I, I worked on several uh, parts of Goblin. First of all, for example, all the full cheese movies, Fabio Frizzi. I did uh, all the keepers for Fabio Frizzi's soundtracks, uh, mainly The Beyond, uh, City of Living Dead, the, the other. Uh, the contraband. Well. Contraband was one was great. great. And, uh, zombie as well. I did even additional keyboards on Murder Rock. It's another fortress. And I just discovered. I've been mean, there too. Uh, yes. It's the only movie that we worked together yeah, without yeah. knowing each other. Yes, right. Because yeah. the sound would be done later. Right? Yeah, that was Keith Emerson soundtrack. Yeah. Keith yeah. uh, left the room before because he was recording at our studio at Trafalgar in Rome. And Lucio Fulci needed more. Another team and some other keepers or some guys as well. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, like the success of those films, I don't think they would even have had the following without those the, the scores. The scores are almost the soundtracks are even to this day they're being currently reissued on vinyl and yeah. selling well by various companies and it's, it's amazing to see the resurgence yeah. of the uh, it was totally different. It wasn't a plan. Uh, first of all, the production was very, very short in terms of time. So we were recording maybe in two days. Three days sometimes, and uh, but behind there was a, a production, a real production. So every even small single soundtrack had a vinyl release with some um, sometimes nice graphic work. And, uh, right. It's totally different. From now it's, it's just everything's different. But it obviously still is current because the band is now touring again, right? <laughs> you're, you're, this is oh, that's uh, something that somebody told us 41 years ago. This movie is going to be screened in 4K yeah, in North America. Nobody will better no, no. ascend. That's, that was the magic that maybe happened with, I don't know, internet that made people aware of things happening 40 years ago. So. It is, yeah. For those that just walked in, we're referring to last night in Suspiria, which is the turn 40 this year. It's one of the most iconic. I mean, the, the sound was just, we couldn't even believe it. it was, it was yeah. mind blowing. Last yes, it was the first time I heard the restored uh, oh. version 4K with the sound. Yeah, I had to say the sound was incredible. Good sound, even loud music. That's what we musicians ask always. For. Yeah, it's the dialogue. It's good music, if it's not uh, interfering with the dialogue, I think music should be loud. Because it drives uh, the emotion of the audience, right? So it has to be yeah. like this. And Very many of those theaters would have been mono in those days, or oh, yeah. you know, to have like this, this yeah. yeah, to hear these, to hear the separation of something else. I would highly recommend. Uh, it's coming out, I think, for Christmas on home video. I think that's the yeah. story. That that's where the kind of the promotion is, and you guys are starting a tour. But it's not. It was a gear to spur. Is that what the tour is all about? Is that why, or is it just you felt it was time to do a tour in North America again, or you wanted to come with, like I'm wearing the '40s shirt right now? But no, it's not actually. It's, Partially related to the Suspiria 40s, because the first first request was from a, a, an Italian Institute of Culture in North America. They wanted to organize something for the 40th anniversary. So around that, we called our booking agent. They said, "Why don't we put add some date around that? Because you know, going to North America just for one show, one show." And uh, that happened. Actually, put together another 14 days. Sorry. And uh, what happened was that that date was cancelled, but the tour remained. So the start of the tour is actually the reason it's supposed to be a 40th anniversary, but it's not directly related to that. So. Um, the, the, the shows, like, um, a lot, there's, a, there's a trend, and, and I know a lot of you shows you put the backdrops and scenes for the movie, or so are you doing that again? Oh, yeah. For, for this. So your set will pretty much just stay constant each from city to city, or do you change it up sometimes based on... Uh, 
probably the been constant but different from the last tour we did in uh, two years ago. So fans were your songs that they didn't hear? Uh... Yes, for every movie we do sort of medley or a suite, playing more things, not just the main thing that we, that we do normally. Suspiria we have two or three things, and uh, Deep Red as well, and even uh, Sleepless. So it will be more, more wide uh, covering of, of the original soundtrack. Because the levels of the music is so hard that you can you don't even notice the absence of a, a vocalist about a show. You can watch an entire full-length concert for the most part. There may be some vocal cues, but there's not many vocals at all. But you can just it's very rare to be blown away for an entire instrumental concert. It's kind of a, yeah, vocal is something that added to the music because you can maybe tell a story and something yeah. like that. But music itself, the vocalist always play a melody, right? And yeah. maybe an instrument. Maybe you may be expressed as a vocalist in the music. And of course, under beings talking about soundtracks, it makes more sense in not playing vocalists. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, uh, anything, else, anything else you guys are working on? I know, Dreddy, you were, you were, you were, you were jumping in the car, you were going to open a Demon's Bar in Tokyo or something? Yeah, or? yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've been told, you know, there's a, the Profondo Rosso in, uh, in uh, Rome where you can go and, and, and just have an entire sort of Argento experience of many of these different kind of films. I'm personally moving to Japan and I, I'm in New Orleans now and I run a uh, screenplay competition for horror and other stories, uh, primarily uh, for projects written by women or girls or you just happen to have a woman in the team. And I've been there about two years doing that, and I was running it from Costa Rica before. But my uh, game plan was always to uh, return to Japan at some point, and we all, all of us involved in the Italian movies, we have quite a um, fan base. In the, the Japanese, yeah, the, what I mentioned earlier, the, the films that were always released in Japan first, yeah. you know, uncut form, and Japan has always been. Like yeah, the, and the, the, and the different together. artwork and the posters. So yeah. I'm at the stage now where my plan, oh, I'll go to Japan uh, later. I'm, I'm at later, so I'm, uh, I'm about to do that. But I'm, I'm, uh, I wrote, and this will be my second feature film, but I wrote and direct a horror film that I'm going to shoot in New Orleans in the next year. And I have a television uh, series that I've been pitching, and I have a, I have a deal with a production company, uh, with a WE, I think it is, that for a uh, reality series that's based on my friendship with a very well-known psychic, so it's a psychic in the screen for you. And, uh, and the things that we get up to in New Orleans, and trust me, it's plenty. <laughs> Dark and dirty and plenty. <laughs> Anybody have any questions or? or if you want to ask us anything or any th things from movies that you wanted to know, what was that all about? Well, you're both known for being involved with horror movies, but what scares you? Oh, mine for me, um, there's two things. Things I don't like. I don't like. Um, I don't like uh, killing just for killing's sake. I don't find it frightening. It just is. Uh, I find it unpleasant. So. Um, that doesn't scare me. Like I just saw like torture yeah, porn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like torture porn. And I, yeah. I enjoyed Salt One. It was a great idea. And I, I met the young filmmakers who did it. And I was down in Australia at that time, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but when it's just that and it's that, that doesn't frighten me. I just feel unpleasant about it. What frightens me is anything that's relentless, anything that doesn't stop. And I, if I, you know, it's my little pet peeve, and it kind of bothers me now how fast zombies are, because that was the point. They're slow and they keep coming, they're slow and they keep coming. That's what scares me. I grew up watching really classic horror. The mummy, the mummy can't die, he's already dead. His little sheets might come up, but then he would just be dragging that one way. <laughs> I love that. And, my, and people have heard me say this before in, in, on tape. My favorite movie, the one that scares me the most, is The Fog. Jamie Lee Curtis in that car, hitting that guy, hitting the gas pedal, the car won't go, the fog's coming. That scares me. Something that won't stop. Anything. Monster stuff. Something that won't stop. That gets me. And then the other thing that scares me is, and I, and you know, who's having, you know, it's Comic Con, so we've got anime too. All right, so I'm wearing this little thing from my favorite. It's called Death Note. So, it's this, it's this book from God's Up in the Sky that falls down to earth, and it says, don't open it. Don't read this. If you read this, that shit's going to happen. What scares me is how stupid people are not to follow the directions. Here's the ring. Turn it off. Turn it off. I'm a typical, you know, whether it's politically correct or not. I'm a black chick in the cinema. Why are you going in there? That's down. Don't run upstairs. That's not what you're doing that. That's dumb. 
That's what scares me. People in danger that do stupid shit. Run the other way. Fall down? Get up. So, talk about uh, things that are relentless. Have you seen It Follows? No, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't yet. And I can't. I know. I know because I know I'm totally going to die. So, literally, if you look on my Facebook, I have two things that says. And I posted recently. I said, can somebody fall in love with me and take me to see it? Because I can't go by myself. <laughs> totally. So, I'm looking forward to it. What scares me? Uh, if I knew, it wouldn't scare me. I mean, uh, I, uh, I'm scared by unknown things or unexpected things. And uh, if there is something that I have to say, it scares me and no matter what, are uh, the size of babies, like very small babies, because they come from nowhere. They come from another world that we don't know. And we are, ourselves come from another world. From, you just come from nothing. You start existing. That is very scary for me. That's a, where were you before? Why you exist now? And a month ago you didn't exist. Where, where were you? But now you are something. That's very scary for me. This is the definition of Italian horror. Who would think of that? I mean, when people go, people always interview me, they go, but why does that happen? And why does this happen in Java? And I keep trying to tell them, it's a different mindset. He's scared of little babies. It's a different mindset. I don't like babies either. They creep me out. <laughs> yeah, and, and even the, that uh, sometimes this music box sound, uh, this kind of stuff, yeah. are in, often used in the movies yeah. because uh, it reminds me when you were already a baby, a kid, a small kid, and uh, everything was scary, the, the dark and stuff. And the judges bring us back to, to something basic that we cannot uh, recognize like uh, as adults. No, talking about the other stuff, no, since I know the trick that they do for movies, that, uh, it doesn't scare me all the blood and stuff, because I know it's, it's fake. Actually, but if I see real blood, I faint. Somebody has to, even a little bit, at least we can wait. Okay. I completely the opposite. People will say all the time, but you're in these movies and you probably can't enjoy them. I'm the opposite. I'm an actress. I do it. I snatch people's heads. You know, the roof of people's heads off. But when I watch a movie, I'm the same as you. I don't. Re I don't remember. I don't care that that's the way they did it. I'm watching it, and for me, it's what if, and it scares me. So I am easily frightened, and I don't like to admit it, but I don't see a lot of horror. It scares me. Have you noticed um, the trend in the Italian films last night? I noticed, you know, Suspiria, I must have seen it, I can't even count how many times. But when you see it on the big screen, it's like, you, I, I couldn't believe how many things in the movie I never noticed before. And I think, like, there's a trend in filmmaking right now where everything's shot for the small screen because people are like, uh, as filmmakers, they don't even send uh, screeners anymore. It's a YouTube link or it's, uh, you know, and, and music videos in general. The people are admitting that they don't even think think with that like cinemascope mind anymore and I think I mean you know I, I don't make fun but I think to an extent it's making a little people lazy uh, a little bit because they have to they have to like it seemed like it would have been so much more work. You know how much time went in to make this room, you know, and visualize how ginormous the screen is going when it's up there for a, 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 a teapot to a plant to a I know. think that's related to the fact that uh, now there's a way, way more information, way more way, way input right. at that time, not only for movies, for albums and uh, LPs. LPs. We were sitting on the sofa, listening to three or four times a new release of LP. Yeah. Now we listen, I don't know, 50 new albums per day. So you don't pay attention to the details and not even the audience. We are not, we don't have enough time to, to enjoy that. So Spirit is an example of all the details that would never um, have any meaning today because people say no this production we need something quicker but we are actually suspire now seeing suspire is, is a bit slow sometimes but that slowness uh, gives you the time to see all the details that we're studying now you know, suspense. No. Yeah. should we talk about the remake or do we even acknowledge the remake is that yeah, no, okay. yeah. We, we will stop and ask to give any music to the remake or is it the we no we we weren't asking do anything and uh, yeah, we can talk about the remake because I don't know anything about it in this. All I've heard is it's almost three hours. Okay, yeah. then they have Jessica Harper from the original that's in a cameo of a role that never even existed in the first one, and then she shot it like in an afternoon or something. And that's all. That's all I really know. It stars uh, the Don Johnson. What's her name? Dakota. 
to go to Spain. Yeah, uh, no. no, the color change. Isn't it the color No, it's not. Whoever the, the, the the from those Fifty Shades. Uh, 50 Shades oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. She's, she plays the Susie Banyan role, and I just find it interesting that nothing has been leaked about the film. Like not even like the only photos are on the set. There's no, uh, they're not even cut a trailer yet. And then when I see uh, Amazon, like I don't, is this thing even coming out in the theaters? Is it going right to streaming or what? Like I just I think uh, I think that's going to be a hard movie to sell it to the fans because that movie is so serious, so iconic that you know you, love it. you don't fuck with some films. Remember that. What you know, the new people love it? Is it yeah. Is it for sure? It's a big challenge for sure. Yeah. 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 Maybe the, the, the choice of Mrs. Spiria was the challenge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so maybe it would be a great movie. That, uh, it would have been much easier to remake Demons. <laughs> you got a question in the back? I got a question for Mauricio. What, uh, when you recorded uh, Spiria, obviously playing the keyboards, uh, I know this is more of a gearhead question, but what did you use? Did you use uh, loops or uh, synclavias or marilites? No, okay. Uh, that, okay. First of all, Suspiria, I didn't play all the movie. Because during the recording we had arguments with Calvin, so I, I played. <laughs> we know, that's a whole other. That's a whole other. Most of it, the, the main thing. Uh, at that time we don't have, didn't have any many choices. So I remember the first time we did this mix of sound with tabla and a mini mood. and that was the first um, version of the, the boom that they listened under, under the Buzuki and thing. And then uh, in studio, I raised somebody with a modular. It wasn't for night, it was for, for night was invented like uh, 12 years after. So uh, everything was uh, un totally analog. But for, for what I remember, it was, it was minimal. And of course, we used uh, acoustic instruments like uh, Celesta to do the, the, the arpeggio and other, other things that we found in the studio. The studio were, um, there were instruments like piano, uh, climate change, but all this. Yeah, I, I can actually remember. I may not have been in the studio when they did the, the, the part of the sequence. But uh, we have very limited uh, amount of things. I remember the book for sure when we, we did the, the sound together with the tabla and uh, but I don't remember actually in particular regarding this people are asking okay what do you use in that contamination what do you use in Boyon? I the answer is I don't remember because the day after we were doing another movie so you <laughs> you never imagine after 30 years people will listen to that movie so it just we were just Day by day, well, thing, so we were not paying attention. It's hard to listen like any other movie. Are keyboards like a guitar though? Like, I mean, there's guitar players that will only use certain guitars. Like, I mean, your rig that you play personally, has it changed much over the years? Are you, are you always happy with the sound? Are you using the same system that you used 10 years ago? Or are you constantly, are you open to new technology? No, no, no. You have to stick to the new technology, not every day, but uh, yeah. yeah, I change. I change over, over the years. I, there are some uh, milestones when I bought my ARP 2600. My Prophet 5 uh, sequence, sequencer circuit, where I bought my CS80. So there are keyboards that uh, you like, uh, you make your sound with those. But of course, you cannot keep using the same thing. So every once in a while, you have to renew yourself. Now we are all using DAWs or software plugins and virtual instruments. So it's just uh, unavoidable. You don't keep like a 1975 rig for the yeah, odd song. I do have everything working 100% at home. But yeah. can you imagine touring now with this stuff? You need a, a yeah, yeah, the yeah. wheel. The roadies yeah. wouldn't even know how to hook it up. No, it's not. <laughs> I used to to go with the heavy stuff, the, the Fender piano, mm -hmm. the organ, the Hammond. But now it's not possible. Then you just need a couple of keys. It's even too much. Are you happy, obviously, to see young fans being in buying Goblin records because the music still, a lot of your audience is younger, they're not all just... Our audience is uh, uh, weirdly so wide. Okay, the, the people our age, even older, they're still coming to see us. So you see people 70 year old, 75, but there are 20 year old guys as well. So you know, we see this, uh, and that's pretty bad for us. I mean, that means that we really did something interesting. For Otherwise sure. that wouldn't happen, right? Anything else going on here? Why? 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 Why
just thinking about the R2600, the profit that he was just mentioned, because I uh, know how they were used back in the 80s all the time for soundtrack sessions. Yeah, I had profit uh, just to just fixed recently because I don't know if you know that uh, in particular. Uh, there's a revision too, very hard to fix, and I had the guy in Toronto that was able to fix it. So it took six months, but the end is working perfectly. Yeah. And the sound is something that brings, brings it back. Yeah. And then you know, were talking about fan base. One of the really nice things, and thank you guys for inviting us, is doing the cons and the festivals. That also keeps bringing the younger fan base. Because I was just doing a show two weeks ago, and I was talking to the little one age group. Let's say they were 12 to 15, and they were like, yeah, and I saw it, whatever, whatever. And then they saw it that night at the screening. They were following me around the hotel for the rest of the show. And <laughs> The, for you, you were saying it's uh, the internet that did it. For my my chain of movies, it was at one point they were just in VHSs when there were still stores that you could go to, yeah. and that was like a party favor of mine. Someone would invite, somebody would invite me to dinner, and I'd be like, "Oh, let's just absolutely, uh, uh, accidentally go to a Virgin Record store because oh look, I'm yeah. in these movies." Because yeah. there was a whole Italian section, section. Yeah. and then when everything switched to um, online and the stores where you can buy it, it's one of the reasons people still know the movies and it's great. I, we have the same thing. We'll have people that were either in Italy or know something about film anyway or you have your hardcore people that like horror from around the world and I still and we get all the new people because of events like yours and, and these venues that get to see it. So it's just great and we really do appreciate it. It's fantastic. Just screening last night there were a lot of folks that had never seen it before. Yeah, that's what it's like. Yeah, that blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was easily half the theater I think yeah. I haven't seen it. And then afterwards, listening to the comments, people just read it about it. So yeah, 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 Because it is a worry when you when you screen a four year old movie, like how's it going to hold up? Because you know I'm so jaded about it. I think. Yes, 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 and there was like no walkouts and a few giggles every once in a while, but no. Yes, and, uh, and, uh, and people I could tell were generally scared that I'd never seen the film before, and it's like wow, it's and I, I've done this played a lot of these time films. It's zombies, so those those are mine, yeah, right? So yeah. it's. Uh, you know, it's great that the revivals keep it going. Uh, you know, it's sad in the way that physical media is kind of dying out a bit, but, you know, when a lot of these films were starting to get re-released on DVD and then now on Blu-ray, you know, everyone was buying them up, but now everyone's just, like, happy with a, with a streaming copy or something, which is kind of important. I'd like to see that kind of change a little bit because it's good for everybody, but still, there are other fans out there that there are companies like Synapse, etc., that, yeah. that are doing that to keep it real. So, you know, because I know a shit ton of work going into that remaster. I think, I think those guys got that negative when they've been working on it for like three years. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they, they really, you know, were swinging for the fences for that. So it's great that it's going to be out for everyone. So. Yeah. Uh, some of the Dario and movies are over in the dealer's room, so if you want to get some, take them over, sign, you've got some stuff at your table too. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's great. And, uh, From a series of directors, there's Bruno Mattei, Lucio Fulci, I worked with Dario, I worked with Lamberto Bava, so I'm glad you're all watching this, and if you're in the room, come on over and see us, and it'll be great. Alright. Ciao, grazie.